Okay, uh, the next unit we are going to talk about, or the next chapter within Unit 5 that we're going to talk about, is all about energy. Uh, energy is going to be a yet another language uh, that we can talk about um, the way things move or interact uh, with each other. And uh, it will be different from momentum and even a bit different from forces. And again, uh, it has its own particular times when it's very useful um, uh, more than other times. So, and at the end of this uh, chapter, we'll go through a bunch of example problems. And you can uh, go through them um, either with momentum or with energy or with uh, forces and kinematics. And um, we'll go try to go through uh, multiples in each manner to see which one's the best and then why. So uh, we'll start off with uh, energy now. <clears throat> All right, energy is one of these alternate languages, and we have different types of energy. Um, as you can see in this picture, going from top left, you know, clockwise, we had something that you could see, um, you know, as nuclear energy. Um, but it's also at nuclear energy is then um, heating up water, and what actually you see coming out of those uh, um, towers, those are actually called cooling towers, um, is steam. So what happens is that nuclear energy heats water, then that, that water evaporates and goes up as steam, which then turns a turbine, which then produces you know movement energy, which then produces electricity, electrical energy that you know you get here at that light bulb right there, eventually coming out. As it comes out a light bulb like that, it's actually heating up that filament in there, which is producing thermal energy, which is then glowing in a way to for, uh, to emit electromagnetic uh, light energy. So. There's all kinds of flavors, and you can see fire, I got solar, electromagnetic, I got you know, electrical, I got um, uh, the woman with the bow is storing potential elastic energy, and all these different types of energy. And what we, if we get all that in one mindset, and the way that uh, how that energy is exchanged, uh, then we can explain everything that's going on in the world, not by forces and kinematics, not by even by momentum, but by energy transformations and energy transfers. So I like to call this the energy family tree. Um, at the very top, the, uh, the grandfather energy there is total amount of energy. That's what, you know, everything, uh, all energy is just part of this, you know, overall energy. But I have different types within that. So what we will concentrate on is almost exclusive, exclusively on mechanical energy. Now for mechanical energy, um, you know, we're going to, actually I'll go through those in a little bit. Those, actually, we'll hold off on that one. Let's talk about the other ones. Uh, thermal energy is from heat. Um, and chemical energy from uh, the energy stored in chemical bonds. Um, and when those are break, broken down, uh, energy is released um, in certain situations. And then when they're formed or whatever, then you know energy is uh, you know brought in. You get uh, chemistry and endothermic and exothermic reactions, all that kind of stuff. There, uh, you have other energy: nuclear energy, electromagnetic, uh, electrical energy, uh, all those things like that uh, that are in that other category. For the most part, we're going to be concentrating on the left two: mechanical and thermal. Now, mechanical, you know, as it implies, comes from m mechanical things or moving uh, kind of objects or things that are storing energy or something else like that. The two main types we have are kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy specifically is the energy from motion, uh, the energy due to motion or just any kind of movement in general. Uh, potential energy is energy due to position or stored energy due to position, and as we'll see later on, we're going to have two different uh, flavors of that. We're going to have gravitational potential energy and elastic or spring potential energy. We'll talk about those in more detail in the future. Um, the only other thing I'll kind of bring up is this thermal energy block right there. Uh, there will be some cases where we'll, 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 we will explain a, um, a transformation of energy. Um, and an energy uh, transformation that leaves, is, leaves mechanical energy and goes to thermal energy. And we'll explain that situation later. Um, but again, the full thing is pr quite complex, like a battery that stores chemical energy that converts it into electrical energy that can maybe uh, run a, you know, a small remote control car. 
that then, you know, puts something in motion with kinetic energy and so on, so on, so on. But this is the general uh, structure of things. A huge, huge part of this um, section and, um, again, this whole unit and, um, you know, momentum also is the definition of a system. And I highlighted it at the beginning of that lecture also. Um, and so we have to take something and essentially draw, draw an imaginary box around it or a circle as I have uh, here. Um, you know, I, you know, draw a circle around it and say that is my system. And I look at what's going on inside of that system and I look at all the energies that are going on, uh, that there are and maybe an exchange of energies that are going on within that system. And I concentrate on that just within the system. Okay, so within a system, you may, you know, take different types of energy. Like from the previous slide, K right here means kinetic energy, energy due to motion. Uh, UG right there is potential due to gravitation uh, or gravity. And then this is potential due to springs. This is thermal energy and chemical energy. You know, like I said, you know, a chemical energy, you know, you can have chemical energy here in a battery that gets converted to electrical energy, which then drives something to, you know, make, you know, have, you know, give it uh, kinetic energy, and then maybe that, you know, go, that uh, remote, tro remote control car drives uphill to get to, you know, gravitational. Again, that's all within the system. They are what we call transformed. There's energy that's transformed from one state to another within a system, and uh, we just kind of keep track of that, okay? One of the most important skills is defining what the system is, right? What's it, part of that system and what energies are associated with those parts and what energy transformations are going on. Now, not all systems are tightly closed, uh, as we just had in the last, last slide. Um, some systems allow interactions and allow energy to come in and energy to leave. Instead of calling that a transformation, we call it transformations, you know, between one form and another, we have energy transfer, okay, energy transfer in and out, oops, and out of a system uh, through interactions with outside objects, uh, outside things, or the environment uh, with the system. So we can be transferred through something called work which we'll talk about more, which is much more mechanical, again, what we're focusing on. Um, again, work is a from in some kind of physical push or pull, essentially a force um, from the outside, and again, that's more mechanical, what we will concentrate on. Or it could be something like heat and thermal, which actually we still work in another way, but it's um, kind of thermal energy that gets transferred. Uh, we'll also kind of you know look at that in certain situations, too. Um, so, you know, we can have energy, you know, coming into the system with a force. We can have energy being taken away um, from the system. Uh, we could have the same amount of energy coming in and being taken away at the same time. Uh, we could have just in or none out. And so there's a lot of different situations that we are going to go through uh, in this section to understand um, how we define, you know, this thing right here. You know, what's the environment, what's our system, what energies are going on, uh, what energies are being transferred uh, in and out of the system. So don't freak out by the equation down there. Um, this is just a concept saying that if there are no net work done on or by the system, then the energy is conserved. The total amount of uh, energy in the system stays the same. Uh, the easiest way I can think about this is, um, let's see, a couple of glasses of water. And I'll pause here. I'll draw some water here. Okay, I got two glasses of water here. And um, so let's see if um, here's the idea. This is maybe one on the one on the left is one form of energy, and the one on the right is another form of energy. So maybe this is, um, you know, kinetic energy, and this is you know, potential energy or something else like that. Um, I can transfer, you know, water from my potential energy here into my, you know, kinetic energy. And that's what's called a transformation, right? Transformation from one energy to another. Um, and if I did that, uh, what would happen? 
Well, I would have um, more kinetic energy than before, and I would have no, uh, none of that potential energy left. But if I lost some, when I poured that in, if I lost some of that energy to the system, right, I made a little puddle over here when I poured, all right, so energy has left my system. Like, essentially, you know, this was, this was my system here. Now, energy has left that that system, or water has left that system, and so, uh, and then, you know, maybe you could also pour in some additional water to compensate for that. The idea is that if there's no change in total, you know, around that, you know, red circle, then, um, then energy is what we call is conserved, right? It doesn't mean that there's no loss of energy, it doesn't mean that there's no gain of energy, it just means that there is no net loss or net gain um, of energy. Now, if work is done on or by the system, as indicated by those red arrows or uh, maroon arrows going in and out of the system, um, then the change in energy is equal to the net amount of work done. And so this probably needs a uh, you know a little uh, net on it right here. So let's actually add that. So this is a net amount of work done. Okay, and um, so, okay, because I, I can have uh, work in, I can be doing work on the system, and um, so let's go here, and so I could have work, you know, coming in, we call that, that would be positive work, and I can have some work uh, leaving, okay. And it'll be negative work. Energy coming in to system being positive and energy going out being negative. If my more energy coming in than out, then I have a net work of that's positive. So energy, more energy is coming into the system than is leaving the system. Again, things could still be going on within that system from one you know form to another. But I look at this and say, oh, okay, my total energy is gained as gaining because of my work in is greater than my work out, all right? Uh, but on the other hand, if my, um, if, if I don't have any work in, you know, going on at all, uh, and I do have energy leaving the system, then I can have a, ne a, a net loss in the energy. So I say that there's a negative work, uh, that net work that goes on. Um, and so if you kind of ignore the stuff going on in the middle, and this is just the idea of all the different forms of energy that there is, it could be a specific gain in kinetic or whatever, but um, that, you know, the change in energy is equal to the net work on the system. It could be positive and negative. And I know we haven't fully defined what work is, but I want you to think of it now as a, you know, um, a force or a transfer of energy into the system or out of the system. Um, you know, you could, if you want to think of this as a, you know, a heat type issue, you know, then it's heat coming in or heat leaving a system. Okay, so since we've been talking about work um, specifically, uh, let's go in a little bit more detail. Um, so, um, Work has a couple stipulations on it. It's not just a, a push or a pull, as we said uh, earlier uh, when we were talking about mechanical things, um, but very specific uh, pushes and pulls and, um, and then the way that they operate. So uh, up on the top here, I have my system uh, with my arrows coming in and out. Um, for now, we're just going to have uh, an arrow you know, in uh, right now. Uh, and not an arrow out. So what uh, that arrow is uh, coming in is some positive work, which is some force that is, the key thing, it has to be an outside force, right? So the force has to come from outside the system. So if I see here, uh, this circle shows my system, you know, mass A and mass B, that is my system. Um, there's an outside force separate from A and B that comes in. So anything internally cannot do work. Like, you know, you remember A pushes on B, right? But B also pushes on A. So those are forces 
on you know on the system, but they're they're internal, so they don't do any work at all. All right, we're only th talking about things outside of the system. That's why the system definition is so important. Um, so that's one condition, and the other thing is that the the whole system. All right, it's not only just a force, but there must be movement that is going on, some kind of displacement. All right, so it's, it'd be like you know, if I hired you to do some work uh, to move a piano or something, and you just went and you pushed on it. All right, you didn't, you know, you didn't do any work, right? Because it didn't move. It didn't, you know, you you had some forces on it, but um, you know, it, it didn't move. So that doesn't really qualify as work. So the two conditions are: it must be an outside force. And it must be uh, moving, all right? There must be some kind of displacement of the object. Now, let's take another scenario. And in this case, we are going to say that now there is both work in and there is work leaving. Um, so there's energy coming in with a force, and then through another force, there's energy leaving. And the easiest way to show that, I'll come back, they still have that same conditions as before, is that what if this was what if this was a rough surface that had some kind of coefficient of friction? So what would happen is that there would some be some kind of frictional force, you know, working against this block. As it moved and had some kind of displacement, there would be some kind of frictional force working against it. Right, and you know, even though I drew that circle and it shows the surface right there, you know, essentially A and B are my system. Right, so the actual surface right there is not part of my system at all, and so the force coming from that surface, right, is actually stealing energy away from that system. Right, if it wasn't for that friction, the energy would keep on going and keep on gaining, and so friction specifically is doing work to steal. Uh, energy away from the system and take it somewhere else. Now, where does it take it? What well, actually takes it to heat up, you know, the floor right here. It actually takes it to uh, make sound um, of screeching or something else like that, or th two things rubbing, right? All that, you know, energy from that has to come from uh, the system, right? And so energy is being stolen away from that system and being transformed into other types of energy outside of that system, which is mass A and mass B. So just like momentum, uh, we're in a bit of a unit of um, rather simple definitions. Um, in the last time, we said, okay, momentum was mass and velocity, or impulse was force times time. In this case, if work depends on force and it depends on displacement, then work, you know, from a particular force is force times displacement. Uh, and the stipulation that we'll hold right now is that the force and displacement must be in the same direction. Um, now, keep in mind, this gets a bit confusing because remember we said in the last section, we said impulse was force times time. And work is force times distance. So the um, key thing is that, or distance or displacement, the um, key thing is that um, when we sit down to do a problem and we have to see which one do I use, do I use impulse and momentum or do you use work and energy, um, if I have a force and a distance, I'm probably going to use energy. If I have a force and a time, I'm probably going um, to use impulse. So here's an example. Uh, Sarah pushes on a 20 kilogram crate with a horizontal force of 70 newtons, a distance of three meters over a five second time period. How much work does Sarah do on the crate? So I know that my force supplied is 70 newtons. I know that the crate is 20 kilograms. And um, let's see, distance is three meters and it's done over a five second time period so delta t equals five seconds okay so i got a lot of information here but actually only some of this is important to me 
because um, I'm looking for how much work is being done. So that means that means specifically all I care about is force and displacement. So this whole mass right here, I don't care about, and the time I also don't care about. So let's just solve this in a simple manner. Okay, so uh, work is my force times time. The force is, I'm sorry, force times distance. Um, force is 70, the distance is 3 meters. So I get 210. Oh, one thing I haven't talked about yet was uh, my units. Um, okay, so force is in newtons, which are kilogram meters per second squared. Uh, and it's being multiplied by a distance, which is in meters, so that gives me kilogram meter squared per second squared, which is a lot to say, which is why we call our unit for, for, uh, for work and energy, everything is in joules. So this is our final answer. 210 joules of work has been done. Again, uh, previously maybe this thing was at rest. It had no energy. Uh, after applying a force for that, you know, three meters, then it did have energy. It had motion energy, and so um, so outside, you know, this is my system here. Then outside force came in and uh, increased the energy of my system. It did positive, you know, 210 joules of work. Now, let's look at the same situation here. Uh, what if, um, a similar one, uh, what if the for, uh, force applied was 70 newtons, but it was applied at a 45 degree angle? Okay, so, well, actually, let's just, let's make it even more extreme, right? Let's make this, um, you know, a full, you know, 89 degree angle or something like that, right? So, you know, as I get more and more and I apply the same amount of force, I actually get less and less you know, rightward acceleration. I get more and more force upward and less and less force to the right. So that's actually not, so I can't just say the force times the distance. I have to add in this other factor here with the angle. All right, so let's, let's look at that in a little more detail. So specifically, only the parallel components of the um, uh, force the ones that are parallel to the displacement actually do uh, any work at all. So when I take a, a force like as shown right here um, on the left and I break it into its X and Y component, that Y component pulling up on the crate uh, doesn't actually move it to the right. It's only that component that, you know, that X component to the right that actually does um, anything to help it along. That Y component is just it's perpendicular to it, it doesn't, it doesn't affect it at all, right? You can't sit on top of a crate or sit on top of a couch while two people are pushing it across the floor and say that, you know, hey, I'm exerting force on it and I'm, I'm doing work. And it's like, no, no, you're just sitting on the couch and the other guys are, you know, the ones pushing it. So it's a very similar thing here that only, this perp only the parallel components actually do work. The perpendicular components do no work at all, right? And the way that we isolate that is by using cosine. So the uh, the angle between the displacement and the force uh, is what we use uh, with this cosine. So, uh, and again, that's the hard rule that we have. And it's kind of similar to, I think, when we did torque and we used sine theta, and theta was the angle between the force and the object, or the radial axis. In this case, it's the angle between the force and the, uh, and the displacement. Um, and just like torque, I can make that any angle. Uh, I can make it, you know, it can be greater than 90. It could be all the way up to 360. Um, and the math needs to work regardless. Um, just keep in mind that any, because it's a cosine, right, any angles between 90 and 270, which means if I draw that out, Ninety one eighty two seventy and zero. Anything this area will actually have negative work because the cosine, you know, the x component is is negative. So this will produce a negative value right here, which actually makes the work negative, which means it's stealing energy away. Right? If the object is moving to the right with a displacement, 
and then the forces are mo you know anywhere in those angles and it's stealing energy away it's slowing down the system All right now if it was moving to the left the object was moving to the left All right it would still be the angle between the force and the displacement and again once again uh anything between 90 and 270 would also be negative work So, for example, um, you know, force one right there, the object is moving to the right, so this is doing positive work, all right, because it's in the same direction. Uh, force two uh, is moving at an angle. Uh, it has an x. It has some kind of component that is in the same direction as displacement, so it's still doing positive work. Force three, the entire force is upward, all right, uh, which is perpendicular. Uh, to the displacement. I could actually use that last equation. I could say cosine 90 and that would give me a zero and tell me that it does no work. Uh, six, uh, five, six, and, uh, sorry, four, five, and six, they all do, um, they all have a force, be an angle between the force and displacement that is greater than 90 and less than 270 and therefore they will all do uh, negative work. Okay, so force one, force two be positive, force three is zero, four, five, and six are all doing negative work. So in that last example, um, I could have multiple forces acting on an object, and um, I could have each one uh, doing work. Some may be doing positive work, some may be doing negative work, some may be doing no work at all. And so I can have a net work that is going on when I add up all of the uh, individual works. Um, another way to do it, which I have on the bottom down here, is that actually I could have found the net force produced by all those forces, and then, you know, say that's my net force, and then use that angle, and, um, and then figured out what the net work is from that. That's the ultimate way to do that. So here I have um, four forces acting on this uh, crate here, and I'm also told that it's moved to the right a distance of uh, 10 meters. So let's find the net work uh, on the system. So let's start off with the 100 Newton force. Uh, it's 100 Newtons that to the right, and it's also moving to the right, which means that uh, it is doing 100 times 10, or a thousand joules of work, and it's specifically positive, right? There's no angle between the force and the displacement, they're in the same direction, so I just say that. Um, see the, up top, you got 50 newtons, okay, well actually that 50 newtons is from the normal force, and that's going upwards, and that is also at a 90 degree angle. And um, so actually this one does uh, zero joules of work. Uh, and likewise, the downward here also does zero joules of work. Uh, okay, and then I have 75 Newtons. Okay, 75 Newtons, let's get this in an equation format. 75, which is my force, times my distance, which is still 10 meters, even though it's going in the opposite direction. And then cosine of the angle, and so I use cosine 180. Okay, and that actually gives me 750, and cosine 180 is negative 1, so that's negative, all right, negative 750 joules. So now I have four works positive 1000, 0, 0, and negative uh, 750, which means my network is going to be positive <coughs> 250 joules of work, is my net work. Uh, the other way I could have found this, too, was saying that, okay, my net force is going to be 25 newtons to the right in the same direction as motion of the object. That, 25, that net force of 25 times 10 is 250 joules, and it's in the same direction, so it's positive. So that's an alternate way of finding it. Which, by the way, this will be a good uh, convenient time to talk about friction when it comes to work. If I actually look at this free by diagram, I could probably assign it, if this was a free by diagram, uh, things like, you know, a thousand, a hundred newtons being applied to the right as my force applied, 
I have 50 newtons of normal force, 50 newtons of weight, and then 75 newtons of probably friction going to the left. And so friction is going to the left because friction always acts uh, parallel to the surface and in, in, and in the opposite direction of motion. So if this is going to the right, friction acts to the left, which means friction will always, always, always have a cosine 180, right, for its uh, work equation, which means, you know, cosine 180 is always negative 1, so friction will always do negative work. It's always something that is stealing energy away from the system, you know, throwing it out of the, out of the system into sound, into um, thermal, into whatever, and stealing energy away. Um, and so uh, it's always doing negative work. Okay, and that, remind, and that leads us back into the reminder of where we started uh, quite a few slides back before we start uh, talk about work in, in more detail, which was the change of energy in the system, right? If I take a, some kind of closed system, right? So here's my, here's my system right there. All right, so all that energy stays the same, right? If, so I have energy in here. But if I have work leaving or energy leaving, that's negative work. And if I have work coming in, that's positive work. But I may have more in than outs. All right, so I may have you know, always here, but I have this, you know, large amount of, you know, you know, in here, so, you know, and maybe an additional thing here. So let's say I have more positives than I have negatives. So I have a network um, that is positive, which means I have a gain uh, in energy. And again, whatever energy transformations go on within here, which we'll talk about all the different types of energy, um, or doesn't really matter, only... <clears throat> Only when you look at the system and the total amount of energy um, is when we're, we're worried about the, the network and the total amount of energy. Okay, now we're going to jump back to the beginning because uh, let's talk about um, things a little bit more specific to, um, to this family tree and things under this mechanical energy umbrella, so kinetic energy and potential. So first we're going to talk about uh, kinetic, and then we'll talk about potential. Uh, kinetic in generic form is energy from motion. So for something to have kinetic energy, um, it m must have mass and it must have velocity. Well, everything has you know mass, you know essentially, um, but you know must have some kind of velocity or some kind of speed to it. Um, uh, for it to have uh, energy. Uh, and the key thing is that velocity, uh, this is a key concept, that velocity or speed has a greater significance, um, which is reflected in this equation up here, that my kinetic energy equals one-half mass times velocity squared. So if any, this is the total kinetic energy is more sensitive to a change in speed than it is in mass. For example, if I double my speed or velocity, I get four times as much kinetic energy, all right? But if I don't double on speed, and let's say I double my mass, uh, I only get twice as much. So it's more sensitive to speed. Um, here's some, and again, uh, the units would be kilograms meter squared per second squared, which is hard to say. So we say joules, named after James Prescott Joule. Um, and so we have some examples here. Uh, some things, you know, uh, it kind of goes into um, like momentum, things I'm afraid of and things I'm not. Again, things with a whole bunch of energy, kinetic energy I am uh, afraid of because it has a potential um, to transfer that energy uh, to me in bad ways. So we had the same slide um, in momentum, but now we're going to look at it specifically from kinetic energy. So question one, how much kinetic energy does a 1,500 kilogram car have traveling at 55 uh, miles an hour? Uh, and actually, if I remember back, uh, 55 miles an hour was roughly uh, 20, uh, sorry, 20 um, meters per second, which is close enough. All right, so I'll set that up. Okay. 
So, uh, kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared or speed squared. In this case, the V really means speed instead of velocity. It really doesn't matter because you can, if you sign a positive and negative in there, it gets squared anyway. So, um, okay, so that's 0.5 times uh, 20 squared times 1500. And that, whoa, that's a big number. So that's uh, 300,000 joules of energy. Okay, and that's going 55 miles an hour. If I doubled my speed to 110, I would actually get four times as much kinetic energy. So I'd get uh, 1.2 million uh, joules or 1.2 megajoules of energy going 110 miles an hour, which is why, you know, speed kills. So, um, okay, let's go to the next one. The key thing is that I cannot use grams, so I need to change that to kilograms. So I'll change that and then put it into the equation here. Okay, so this bullet, um, and so it's one half uh, mass of 0 0.052 once it's changed to kilograms, times 882, so 0.5 times 0 0.052 times 882. Oops, and I must square that. Squared. Don't forget the squared. 20226 joules. So 20,200. And 26 joules. Less than the car, but again, I'm still afraid of the amount of work that that bullet can do on me. And last but not least, how much kinetic energy does a 100 kilogram train have while at rest? If it is not moving, it has no velocity, it has no speed, it has no kinetic energy. Okay, so next example, a two-man bobsled has a mass of 390 kilograms. It starts from rest. Uh, if the two racers push on the sled for the first 50 meters with a net force of 270 newtons, key, for, th key thing is says a net force, which means, um, you know, the combined force between the two is 270. If I neglect friction, what is the sp speed at the end of the 50 meters? So if I go back here, uh, now that I know what kinetic energy means, I can actually go back and uh, look at this. Uh, equation that I had before and uh, figured some things out from that. So what I'm going to do is pause here. I'm going to do a before picture and then after picture. Okay, on top I have my before picture and on bottom I have my after picture. Uh, it starts from rest initially and then it reaches some kind of final velocity uh, at the end. Uh, and that, uh, that final velocity came from the fact that those two were pushing at it uh, for a distance of 50 meters. Uh, keep in mind, if I do a free body diagram, you know, from this, I would have, you know, weight of the sled going down. It, you know, again, the sled is my, in this case, the sled is my system that I'm concentrating on. Um, okay. And I would have the weight of the sled going down. I have the normal force going uh, up. And then I would have the applied force going on. There's no friction going on, so... Um, but you know it's moving to the right, so essentially this does no work, and uh, the, both the weight and normal force do no work at all. So uh, the applied force is the only thing doing work. So that's and we know that that has a uh, combined 270 newtons. Okay, so let's uh, let's go to the mathematical side and do that. Um, okay, so that means my change in energy. Oops, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, change in energy is equal to uh, my network. Well, I only have one work going on, which is the applied force, um, which we know is 270, times the distance times cosine theta. And my change in energy, well, it had, what kind of energy did it have before? Uh, so by the way, change, remember, is always final minus initial. So this is final energy minus initial energy. So what kind of energy did it have at the end? Uh, well, it had kinetic energy and final. And what kind of energy did it have at the beginning? Uh, well, it had, a kinetic, it had a kinetic energy initial, which was really just zero because it wasn't moving at all. So whatever energy it has at the end came from this work right here. So this is one-half mass times final velocity squared 
which is equal to uh, force applied distance cosine theta. And this is one half the mass of the sled, I believe was 390. And it reached some kind of final velocity, which I'm looking for. And that gets squared. Uh, my force applied was um, 270. 270. Um, and for a distance of 50 meters, and then cosine of the angle between uh, the force and the displacement. The force is to the right, displacement was to the right, at least in the drawings I made. So that's cosine of zero, which is one. All right, so now I just got to solve this algebraically for final, final velocity, 270 times 50, okay, and times two divided by 390, and give me a nice square root right there, and that means 8.3 uh, meters per second. So 8.3 meters per second, so somewhere around 18 miles an hour, which is pretty quick. Okay, so that's what we do to solve for um, a change in energy that comes from work. It also integrated, you know, the idea of being able to calculate kinetic energy. Again, before it had zero kinetic energy. Afterwards, it had some kinetic energy that had to come from, you know, some outside force, which were the, the bobsled uh, people, and uh, that changed the energy of the system. So while we're on kinetic energy, we have to also consider rotational kinetic energy. We said inner kinetic energy was energy due to motion, but as we did a whole section on rotation, you know, there's more than one type of motion. It's not just right and left and up and down motion, but it can be you know, clockwise and counterclockwise. So we're going to have to translate everything over like we did with angular momentum, with you know, angular forces or torques and everything um, again. So um, instead of one half mass times velocity squared, my rotational equivalent of mass is moment of inertia, which we can calculate from those charts. And then instead of uh, speed or velocity, we have angular speed or angular velocity. Um, and again, we don't have to keep track of directions and uh, we no vectors really in the energy chapter, which is nice. Um, angular velocity also has a greater influence uh, keep in mind also that we still have the same units of joules, okay? So we say K rotational um, is equal to one-half uh, moment of inertia times um, angular velocity squared. And there may be times if I take an object like a disk or something like this that um, has, let's say it's moving across a surface, and I'll make a surface here. And as it rolls across the surface, and I say, okay, what kind of energy does it have? I really have to consider that, it, you know, and remember that it has both kinetic energy, regular, translational is what is, you know, linear, tangential, or whatever, you know, translational is probably the better word in this case. Um, and it has rotational kinetic energy. So both of those are going on at the same time, um, which you know, means that if I take a ball and I roll it down a hill, or I just, you know, release it on top of a hill, by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, you can say, okay, well, it has kinetic energy, but it actually has two types of kinetic energy. It has kinetic energy because it's going down the hill, and it has kinetic energy because it's rolling, uh, too. And we actually have to keep track of both, uh, which can get a bit complicated. Now we're going to transition to potential energy. And potential energy specifically is going to come from uh, what we, generally what we say stored energy. And you can always relate it to stored energy from a particular position. Um, that position with a spring is going to be how much you stretch or compress it. And that potential energy when gravity is going to come from how high above you know, some reference point are you. Um, <clears throat> they are potential energies and they store energy because specifically they are conservative forces. Not all forces will store energy. Uh, and like an example of a non-conservative force would be uh, friction. That doesn't store energy for use later. It dissipates. It changes energy into sound and thermal. Uh, you can't really gain that energy 
you know, back in any you know, immediate way versus like a spring. It's going to take energy to compress that spring, but as you, you know, compress it, you're actually storing in there. As soon as you let go, that energy is going to pop back. Um, and same thing with gravity. You can lift something up and it's actually storing it, and then as soon as you let go, again, it's going to, you know, release that energy back. All right, so non-conservative forces, friction, you know, applied forces and tensions, all that kind of stuff. Don't store energy, and then uh, so they're they're not part of this potential energy uh, kind of family. The first one to talk about is gravitational potential energy, and it's energy stored um, by essentially an object's relation with gravity. You know, everything wants to fall down, so the more I lift it up, the more energy I store for it to later fall. Okay, so um, so energy is stored and it's getting ready to be transformed because as soon as I let go it's actually going to store take all that stored uh, gravitational energy and convert it into um, kinetic energy so what does it depend on the amount of gravitational energy uh, it depends on the mass of the object uh, the height of the object above some um, some set point and I get to set that point that's kind of a nice thing and the G value, which we know is the gravitational field strength. Here on Earth, that would be 9.8. Uh, we don't have to use negative 9.8. We can just use uh, 9.8 since it's just the value of it. Um, so those three things are what it depends on. One more point on this, which is a little bit strange. Um, because the AP exam is, gets very uh, technical in the way they define a system. If the Earth is not part of the system, let's say like this this jumper, right? This jumper right here. If I just make him the system, just him, then the Earth is not part of the system. That person does not have gravitational potential energy because the Earth is not part of that system. But if I said the jumper and the Earth are part of the system, then in, and only then can it have gravitational. It seems complicated, or it seems like it wouldn't keep track of things, but uh, essentially if I'd made this person, you know, the system, um, and then, so I would actually have a force of gravity acting on him, you know, some kind of force of gravity or weight acting on him downwards, and that would actually be doing a force from the outside over a certain distance as he falls, which would actually be work. So it all works out the same way. It's just uh, the AP is going to be very specific on that. And it's a little bit nitpicky and it's a little bit strange even to physics teachers the way that they present it. Now the most important thing here is that uh, when we uh, use this equation is that we use the Y value that is um, from some reference point. And we're free to pick that reference point. Usually the most convenient thing is to pick the ground or something else like that. But if I had asked you, like, you know, if I drop a ball on a table, um, then probably the table would be the most convenient reference point there. But the key is that whatever I set as a zero point, I do all my analysis based off of that, and I don't change it. In the same way that we did that with uh, kinematics, right? We had to set some zero point here. So... Probably the most convenient thing is the bottom of the cliff or the canyon on that, you know, diagram on the left. But I could choose the middle or I could choose the top. And you get some odd things like negative potential energies. But again, the total amount of energy would actually uh, keep track and stay the same. So example here, you climb the stairs of the Empire State Building from the bottom floor to the top. At the top, you're 320 meters above the bottom floor. How much potential energy do you gain if you have a mass of 70 kilograms. So the first thing I have to do is set kind of some kind of zero point here. Um, so let's set the ground floor as my zero point. So this is my you know, y equals zero, which means when you get to the top up here, you're at a position of y equals 320. Um, if I had set the top as my zero point, then your initial point would be negative 320. If I set the middle as my zero point, then my initial point would be negative 160, and I would gain up to 320, and it would all work out the same. 
So how much did I gain? Um, so my, well, it'd be a change or whatever, so it'd be my final minus initial, but I know that I didn't have any initially, so let's just find my uh, potential energy at the end, uh, which is my mass times g times the height of the object. Uh, also notice that mg is weight. So if you actually know the weight of the person in newtons, you could actually use that instead of... Um, I'm sorry, I used H there instead, but, you know, either way, uh, I could use this as, uh, sorry, Y. Um, weight times the, uh, the position in Y. Okay, so mass is 70, and then I get 9.8, and I get Y is 320. All right, so that's 70 times 9. 70, do that again, 70 times 9.8 times 320. Whew. Okay, so that's 219520 joules. Okay, that's actually how much energy it would take you, and uh, you could convert that to calories and see how many calories you burned um, by walking to the top of the Empire State Building. Okay, that's uh, quite a bit. Um, Again, I don't know the conversion between joules and calories, I forget, but you could actually calculate that and see what the, the fat burn or the calorie burn would be. Now, the most awesome thing about energy is that the path that you take does not matter. Just like in the last example, I mean, technically, when you take the stairs, you're not climbing a ladder, but you're going, you know, a diagonal or whatever. That path actually does not matter. It only matters about your uh, initial and final positions relative to each other. So, again, whether the hiker takes path A or path B, um, it doesn't matter. Um, the total amount of energy change is the same. Okay. So, if he went up path A and then it dipped back down and then back up again, it still wouldn't matter. Okay. The, the amount of energy change would be the same. So I don't care about the path taken, I don't care about the horizontal distance traveled, I only care about the vertical things when I talk about potential energy. In the last bit here with energy uh, types, I will talk about spring or elastic potential energy. Uh, is energy stored from springs or elastic materials? It could be a rubber band, a bungee cord, a spring, um, you know, anything else like that. Um, it depends on two things. One is how much something has been stretched or compressed. Okay, so the more I stretch a rubber band, the more energy I store in there. The same thing with the spring or compress it. Uh, that's reflected in that delta X right there. And the other thing is how stiff the spring is. Uh, we all know that some rubber bands are, you know, like tighter than others. Um, some springs are easier to pull on than others. You take like a big trampoline spring, and that is extremely hard to stretch, right? It takes an enormous amount of force to do that. Uh, yet you can take something like a slinky and stretch that one easily. So that's because it has different stiffness. And that comes together with the equation of the potential spring energy, which is U, capital U-S, as you go to one-half K. K is going to be our stiffness which we'll call a spring, st spring constant, times the, um, the stretching, the stretch of the, the stretch of compression of the spring, which is delta x, and that gets squared. So you can see that here, the delta x, the stretch of the spring, depend, you know, it changes things greater than uh, the spring constant. So specifically, the spring constant represents a numerical value that describes the spring and the stiffness of the spring. Uh, it takes in a whole bunch of different factors. It's something that you have to kind of experimentally get. Um, the thickness of the coil, uh, how tight it's wound, uh, the material itself, is it aluminum, plastic, duplex stainless steel, you know, all these kind of things. Uh, the units are newtons per meter, which is literally because it's like how many newtons of force do you have to exert in order to stretch it one meter. And, um, and again, delta x is what we said before. 
is uh, how much has been stretched. And it has to be relative to some um, point, what you call the relaxed length or the rest length. If I were to just put the spring on a table, you know, lay it down flat, you know, it would probably go to its rest length. Uh, so it's really relative to that point is, uh, is, what, uh, is what we use for that delta x. Now one thing that we have to um, bring up here is that when we talk about springs, um, there's a force that it takes to compress a spring or stretch a spring. And the force that it requires, the amount of force that the spring exerts back on you, uh, either a pull or a push, um, is given by something called Hooke's Law. It's a linear relationship by how much I can, um, you know, it changes. So if I, the more I stretch it with that delta x, Again, given a certain constant, spring constant, which is a K, um, constant for that spring, then the more force I get. So the more I stretch it, the more force pulls back at me. So like a bow and arrow, if I just you know stretch that bow a little bit, I get a little bit of force back. The more and more I stretch it, then the greater the amount of force that comes back at me. And this will come up in the next chapter uh, when we analyze that, and it'll, but it'll be a couple things here when we do. Uh, one thing to keep in track of, um, especially calculus type people, it means that I have a position dependent force that is negative k, um, you know, delta x, or I'll just say x, you know, some position. All right, so if I have a position dependent force, the more uh, I change a the position, then the more force I get. So it's not a linear thing. So I can't just, that means my acceleration changes all this stuff. I have to use, you know, calculus for stuff. So um, when I look for a work, uh, work when it comes to calculus is the integral of a force, you know, dx, right? So actually when I take the integral of this and I say, okay, if I stretch a uh, spring a certain amount and I do the interval from, you know, zero to some distance here, what do I get? Well, this is the integral of the force is negative k <coughs> x uh, dx where um, uh, k is a constant, so it can be brought out. And when I take that interval, yeah, there's a negative in there <coughs> having to do with direction and work. Uh, but I get one half k x squared. Um, oops, I forgot my k in there, so let's erase that. Uh, one half k and then x squared. There's a negative in there because of direction and and types of work, but um, which is the work? Sorry, which is the amount of energy stored in the spring? So the more I comp stretch a spring, the more I store in there. How much do I store? I store that exact same amount as um, what I calculated earlier. Okay, so let's do an example here. Uh, an archer pulls back on the string of her bow to a distance of 70 centimeters from its equilibrium position. To hold the string of this position, it takes 140 newtons of force. How much elastic potential energy is stored in the bow? Okay, so let's say this, if I mark up this, um, this thing right here, this string wants to be like this. I know it's a compound bow where it gets complicated, but we're just going to do it like this. That's its rest length and it's been stretched um, you know, some distance here of 0 0.7 meters. So 0 0.7 meters has been stretched. Um, to hold it there, it must be a force of 140 newtons. Okay, so ultimately what I need to know is is how much spring potential energy is held back with that bow. So it's one half k x squared. Well, I know that this uh, delta x right there is 70 centimeters or 0.7 meters. So I can plug that in if I wanted to right now. But the thing is, I don't know what that spring constant is. So I actually have to use the rest of the uh, information to find that. And what I know is that there's a force when I hold it of 140 newtons. And that's negative k x is the amount of force. And that negative just means the opposite direction. So essentially, um, you know, if uh, my force, uh, let's see, if the spring is being stretched uh, to the left, which gives it a negative, you know, uh, value for, you know, x, 
then my, uh, my force from the spring is going to be to the right. So this, that negative just keeps things honest. So let's see, okay, the force was 140 newtons. Uh, that's how much the person has to pull to the right. And, um, and then, so let's see, the negative, again, the negative tends not to matter except for direction. Uh, so I may throw that out in a little bit. Um, and K is what I'm looking for. And then, okay, well, I will, I'll keep it around because I know it's been stretched to the left of zero, oops, do that right, uh, negative 0 0.7 uh, meters. So now when I solve for um, that, I get 140 divided by 0 0.7, which should be, yep, should be a spring constant of 200 newtons per meter. So now that I know that, I can take that and take it and put it over here. So my spring kinetic energy is one half, uh, 200 times 0 0.7, and that gets squared. So 0.7 squared um, times would be 100. So that is going to be uh, 49 joules of energy. So 49 joules of potential energy. Again, that's being that's waiting to be released, essentially transformed eventually into kinetic energy, which should be transferred also to the arrow itself.